Out of curiosity, I wanted to see if the science behind oversleeping was just as unhealthy as the science behind sleep deprivation, and a meta-analysis from 2016 actually showed me some interesting results. I am not a doctor or clinical practitioner, I am an internet academic researching human performance, and this video is not medical advice, but most recommendations for sleep go between 6 and 7 to 9 hours of sleep, and if we plot sleep duration across the x-axis, and then all cause mortality on the y-axis, you can see at 7 hours we have a risk of 1, a risk value of 1. As we sleep less than 7 hours, we move into the area most spoken about in sleep science, which is sleep deprivation, and that is where all-cause mortality risk goes up and increases, which is what you would sort of expect. Now, the list of health-related risks that could be contributing to this association that we see in the graph isn't necessarily causation and more likely correlation. A common explanation of the difference between correlation and causation is using summer and ice cream sales and sunburns. So as summer comes out, the heat increases and people want to cool down, so they buy more ice creams. Therefore, the sun is causing ice cream sales to increase. Now, because people are outside, obviously, they are more likely to get sunburn because you get sunburned from the heat, so the heat actually causes more sunburn as well. So as sunburn increases, so does ice cream sales increase, but they are correlated, not caused, because ice cream sales don't cause sunburn, and nor does sunburn cause the increase of ice cream sales. They are just correlated with the heat of summer. And if we take some of those health-related risks associated with sleep deprivation, it's a bit more complex than the ice cream and sunburn example, but it's not quite causation. Sleep deprivation increasing obesity levels is a correlation, not causation. Yes, sleep deprivation does affect hunger hormones. Levels of ghrelin increase, making us feel more hungry. Levels of leptin decrease, also making us feel more hungry. But feeling hungry doesn't cause weight gain or obesity. It's the act of being in a calorific surplus or eating or consuming more than you're actually expending, which leads to weight gain and therefore potential obesity levels. We can impact those hunger hormones in lots of different ways. Yes, sleep deprivation is a factor, but it's not the most significant factor. Getting an appropriate amount of sleep will help regulate the hunger hormones, but so will reducing stress levels, eating appropriate amounts of protein, carbohydrates, fats, drinking enough water, and the list goes on. So sleep deprivation is correlated with increasing obesity levels, but it's not causing increased obesity levels. Sleep deprivation is also associated with cancer, which is an alarming link. But when looking at a meta-analysis, looking into this relation and other related studies, there was evidence that there was an increased risk in Asian populations due to the lower levels of melatonin, which has been found to suppress cell proliferation and initiate phases of tumorogenesis, which are the hallmark signs of cancer. So using melatonin as the potential mechanisms, we could also say that stress is causing cancer, weight gain is causing cancer, age is even causing cancer, but they're not actually causing cancer, they are just related to a potential mechanism that could be causing cancer. Now, I use stress, weight gain, and age as potential causes for cancer because they affect melatonin levels. Now, just because they affect melatonin levels doesn't mean they're going to cause cancer, it just means they could be correlated with cancer. And oversleeping was actually associated with an increase in colorectal cancer for everyone, not just the aging population. And when plotting sleep duration and the odds ratio of cancer risk, you can see sleep deprivation is relatively low when comparing it to oversleeping. So not only is the relation between between sleep deprivation and cancer theoretical, as melatonin levels is just one proposed mechanism, not finding a certain causal relation. Please share any link to a study if there is one, as I couldn't find one. But sleeping more actually shows you're at a higher risk, but again, a correlation, not causation. In addition to that, other factors like smoking, alcohol consumption, weight gain, and physical inactivity have a bigger overall impact on cancer risk when looking at the correlated and some causal studies. Now, when we look back at the relationship between sleep duration and all-cause mortality, you can see oversleeping actually increases much faster when it comes to all-cause mortality and to a higher point. So oversleeping actually has a bigger risk than sleep deprivation. And this meta-analysis did include individuals with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, which affects approximately 4% of middle-aged men and 2% of middle-aged women. And sleep apnea essentially decreases your sleep duration and sleep quality over time. And this is significant because sleep apnea is also associated with other health risks like obesity and cardiovascular disease. And when we look back at the plot and consider other health-related issues, the question around causality and correlation becomes even more apparent. 
Individuals with sleep issues like sleep apnea, sleep insomnia, or sleep paralysis are likely to get less sleep, potentially falling into the categories of being sleep deprived. And as many studies have stated, and other people in the public eye, sleep deprivation decreases cognitive performance. And looking at another meta-analysis, it is actually the decreased attention that is impacting the cognitive decision making and the memory losses that you could see in decreased performance due to sleep deprivation. So this is the path of thinking I'm going down when thinking about all of the things that I found. Being in a sleep deprived state can decrease levels of attention, potentially due to the decreased glucose metabolism in the brain, in other words, the brain doesn't have the energy to think. This could impact our decisions around our health behaviours, like eating, exercising, going outside, etc. Those poor health decisions are what cause the health-related risks to increase, which is where the all-cause mortality relative risk value increases. So the less sleep you get, the poorer your health decisions, the higher the risk goes up. On the other hand, you might already be making poor health decisions, which could impact your quality of sleep, which will then contribute to those poor decisions, creating a bit of a downward spiral, so the sleep duration and quality being a symptom before a correlation. This spiral and circle of all other related issues comes down to the decisions you are making about your actions. Being sleep deprived is just a factor that is making those decisions harder to make, just like stress, prior beliefs, prior habits, and other impact factors. When we look at the other side of the ideal seven hours and looking into oversleeping, it is still correlation, not causation. Now, people with depression are more likely to be in bed longer or sleep longer. Now, that doesn't cause death, but it does mean you're going to be less active. So physical inactivity, less energy, oftentimes less food consumed. So those other health related activities are actually increasing mortality risk there rather than the oversleeping. Low socioeconomic status and unemployment have similar effects leading to physical inactivity and other health related activities. Undiagnosed health conditions, poor health status, chronic fatigue, are all associated with oversleeping, but they are also all associated with higher risk of mortality. So does oversleeping cause mortality? No, but for people that are oversleeping, there is more likely other life health factors leading to oversleeping, which could be increasing the correlation for increased risk factors. Now, a paper from 2014 has been going around the strength and conditioning field recently, and it talks about chronic sleep deprivation increasing the risk of adolescent injury. The thought process behind the study was that there is loads of research showing that sleep deprivation decreases performance, cognitive performance, i.e. attention, as we spoke about earlier, and that lack of attention could therefore increase injury risk. So this study had 112 adolescents with an average age of 15.2, split 54 male and 58 female. 77% of them slept less than 8 hours a night, the remaining 23% sleeping, I assume, between 8 and 10 hours, as the chart shown doesn't go beyond 9 hours. They found that those that slept less than 8 hours have a 1.7 higher likelihood of being injured over the others, which is quite significant. But there were some observations I made when reading this and thinking about the prior research in sleep science. There were 205 reported injuries for 64 of the individuals, which is 57%, meaning 48 people never reported an injury. Now, you can do the math. Some individuals reporting multiple injuries over the 21 months the study was active. Another thing to think about is these are all adolescents, which actually increases the likelihood of injury because they're going through physical changes. They are going through growth changes, different load changes, physically, emotionally, mentally, so the likelihood of injury is increased. Then reading that student athletes are required by school policy to report all injuries to the athletic training staff and the, the injuries were defined as any injury that required a visit to the athletic trainer's room for evaluation and or treatment. So what this says to me is anyone with a pain that could potentially be a growing pain that's impeding their ability to play sport or perform is classed as an injury. Another point was that strength training was actually deemed a high risk factor of injury. Now, I know through my research in strength and conditioning and youth strength and conditioning specifically that strength training is actually useful and beneficial for individuals to prevent injury and enhance performance. And this study finding the opposite of a whole field of research does beg the question, how did they get to that conclusion? It could have been down to the quality or quantity of the sessions they were doing, but there was no way to see that because in the study they didn't report any load measurements through the training sessions, whether that was the sports sessions, PE, extracurricular, or strength training, so there's no way to know the load the individuals were under. So we have the majority of individuals sleeping under 8 hours with a high likelihood of injuries being reported due to the reporting policy, age, and training changes. 
I could not see anything that measured the time of day they trained, the amount they trained in a day, or any other load-related metric to look at the cause of injury because, as I said earlier, sleep often isn't the cause, it is just correlated to the behaviours that increase risk. And I think we can all agree that sleeping more or less won't make us injured, it is that combined with load metrics that makes the impact. So I interpret from this study is that sleep is a factor related to injury, but without any causal mechanics it is just a correlation, not causation. And there are plenty of other studies that share similar conclusions and similar recommendations for sleep, all increasing this anxiety around how much you should sleep, whether you're sleeping too much or not enough. Yes, sleep is important. If it wasn't important, our body wouldn't have evolved to make us do it. No, sleep can't kill you, but poor sleep duration and quality can contribute to other health-related risk factors that can increase the likelihood of mortality. And yes, sleep levels can and do impact performance. But I don't think it requires us to be stressed out about the amount of sleep we get, because at the end of the day, stress is a risk factor to sleep quality, sleep duration anyway, and other health-related risk factors to sleep, as previously mentioned, and there are loads of others in research as well. The fact that sleep deprivation is actually used as a therapy to help individuals just goes to show that sleep deprivation has benefits, has uses, so it can't be all that bad. So before jumping to conclusions or believing what a narrative says, I think we need to go behind and understand the science behind the comment, behind the conclusion, behind the research, before we make any actions and change any behaviours. As a final thought, if sleep deprivation does cause all cause mortality risk to increase, can we therefore say that parenthood is actually increasing all cause mortality? All of my notes and research from prior videos, this video and future videos, if research does change and my narrative does change around this topic, it's all shared on my Obsidian Publish, which you can find a link in the description below. And I'm always intrigued to hear more research, more thoughts around any topic that I share in a video, so make sure you comment down below. So until next time, get off YouTube and do something productive with your time instead.